Well, Richard, thank you for all the time you've taken with us so far, and uh, we thank our listening and viewing audience. Uh, and I, I know I, I found this to be a, a completely fascinating um, talk, and I'm grateful for you to being so open and sharing so much. How many people do you think are still with us? Well, again, we'll, we'll divide it up into different segments, and we'll describe the types of things that are on there, but I think uh, there's rich, rich stuff in each segment that we've covered. But I know that this last segment that we're going to do right now is is really been on a lot of people's mind. You're a, you're a fascinating character in, in Mormon history, in a sense of at least Mormon culture. Um, a lot of people um, res respect your talent. They they want you to still be our teammate <laughs> for those who are, are within the, the Mormon struggle. And they're curious about your journey, you know, from the open-hearted sincerity of God's army 10 years ago to someone who in the Provo Herald seven years ago, or th three years ago, so 2007, seven years later after God's army, sort of said, I'm done with Mormon cinema for sure. <laughs> um, and and you, you indicated that the, the church in some ways too, though you've, you've kept somewhat quiet about your different, uh, you know, exactly how post-Mormon you are and things like right, that. So right. appreciate your willingness in advance to, to talk about these things, set the record straight, to clear up any uh, perceptions about you, to talk about your family and how they've handled this journey and, and as they've watched you and perhaps gone along with you in, in some ways too. So if, if we can just dig in right into your Mormonism today or at least maybe start with how it got to you know the stepping stones or, or things that sort of show the evolution of your faith. Okay. Yeah, this is difficult. And is you, difficult can, you can to, dive uh, in wherever you want there. That was... Yeah, difficult to, to, to talk about yeah, or to even start? see because it's such a, such a huge and complex uh, topic. I guess, I guess uh, the important thing to talk about first is, uh, yeah, I've been very reluctant to speak about it in any real depth. First of all, mostly because I don't really have the forum to talk about it in any real depth. Um, you know, it's like somebody is writing a newspaper article and they want to talk. It's like, I, I, there's not even a, there's no point to even beginning because first of all, they'll just take the most provocative things and that's the only thing that'll be out there. And, uh, and taken out of context, it's just, uh, it's too complex. So I haven't really talked about it. Also, I haven't talked about it much because I don't um, think it will do any good. Um, just as I used to say, you know, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in making any more Mormons in the world. I used to say that a lot when I was uh, making the the films. I, I was interested in the films and making good movies, and it wasn't about missionary missionary work. work. Um, and now I certainly don't want to make any fewer Mormons in the world. And also, I didn't, I didn't leave with. Uh, with uh, an issue, I didn't leave with an ang you know I didn't leave angry. There, there was certainly anger there, and we'll, we'll need to talk about that. But uh, it, it's always been. I mean, I loved Mormonism. I I, uh, I think I could say I still love Mormonism, but I, I certainly loved it. It was uh, it was such a, a very important thing for me. And I love the community. I still love the community and the people. So yeah, I have zero interest in uh, causing any kind of conflict, you know, which is really not what I'm about at all. And I have zero interest in delving into specific issues that I'm completely at peace with, uh, but that are so contentious that you know it uh, it just becomes about the argument rather than about the issue or the the truth claim. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky thing to talk about. So I, I guess we should talk about it in the sense of, uh, we, we talked a little bit in the, in the previous segment about, you know, my spiritual history in the sense of being raised Pentecostal, 
being brought into Mormonism by my stepfather and that it really appealed to me, you know, intellectually and emotionally. It, it was a good fit, you know, for me, for my personality uh, and my psychology. It was a great fit. And uh, some formative experiences that happened later were, you know, there was, a, there was that point when I got to be, you know, the, the Mormon story was very powerful. For the Joseph Smith story was a very powerful, psychologically powerful story, especially for a young man you're growing up. I mean, I remember going, I, I, we lived in Kentucky for a while, and we had these, this great forest behind our house, there's woods, and so I would go back there and I would pray, and I was, you know, I was fully expecting to have Moroni come, or, you know, Jesus, wouldn't that be great? And they were very sincere prayers, but that, that, that narrative was very much in my mind. And... Uh, and I kind of viewed, I guess, that Joseph Smith story kind of lived, really lived in me and in my mind. And when I got to the point of being about 14, the, uh, and this is all, you know, not surprising at all, but, you know, you're in Mormonism, you're encouraged so strongly to get your own testimony, you know, to pray and, and read the Book of Mormon. And I was, <clears throat> as, a, as a kid, I was the most uh, studious young Mormon that I knew. You know, I'd read the Old Testament. By the time I went on my mission, I'd read the Old Testament twice, the New Testament several times, Book of Mormon so many times. The Doctrine of I wasn't one of these missionaries that went in unprepared. I, I knew it all. I, knew, I, I shouldn't yeah. say I knew it all. but You, you, know were, well, I mean? you were a well-prepared I was very well-read, you know. And so, um, but at 14, it was important to me to get that testimony. And so I was just following along in the, in the pattern that had been said, a lot of praying, a lot of scriptures and um, but I did have a really a really powerful experience that uh, there are a few experiences in my life that in my post Mormonism I've had to really look at you know it's like and, and really examine and you know recognize that these were genuine experiences what did they mean and how does that how does that fit into my my current world view and but, and one of those experiences was during this period where I was searching and, you know, reading and praying and wanting a testimony and not really getting anything. And then, then uh, my family went to, uh, for a Nauvoo, Carthage vacation, and I went through the Carthage jail. And, and, and that, that experience I put into the, the experience of Elder Banks, the black missionary in, mm -hmm. in God's Army. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But it was, it was my experience of being there and very, you know, I was just there doing the tourist thing and sitting in that room and listening to the, what had happened. And, and it just moved me so powerfully. I was just overcome with emotion and I was fighting back tears. And I really did feel like the way I described it in God's Army was like the Holy Spirit just walked in and sat down in my body. And I was so filled with light and love and 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 sorrow for what had happened and everything and and of course my my interpretation of that was i've had i've you know i've seen i've seen the light i've had the experience the church is true joseph smith was a prophet and etc etc and, et cetera, et and et cetera, this et cetera, i can et extrapolate from this to everything's true exactly yeah, exactly that was a very specific moment. and it was such a real and a genuine experience and something that i was that i didn't feel like i was generating it's just something that happened mm -hmm. And so that, and that's what carried me through my teenage years and everything, you know, I, I spoke briefly about the, you know, I had a, a little bit of a rebellious independent phase and then uh, everybody was surprised when I decided to go on a mission, but because of the, the experience with uh, Return of the Jedi or whatever, that... Uh, and it just dawned on me when you said George Lucas, your oldest son is named Lucas. Was that? Yeah, but it's honestly the, not. It's not, honestly not. not, not oh, but, it's, but it's a nice okay. correlation. But yeah. no, that's not. That's not why his name Lucas. Um, but so that was an, an experience, and of course, on, in the mission field, I had so many really fantastic experiences that seemed that just always seemed to confirm that I was doing the right thing in the right place, and and uh, I, I was a very uh, sincere missionary. I was very. Um, I I believed I worked hard and uh, and was really seeking, you know, even as a missionary, I was still seeking uh, God and seeking experiences where I could feel that, that divine connection, which was really important to me. And there were times when, like, uh, blessing, a, a, I remember a gentleman, a man, a father of a couple that we were teaching, which, now that I'm thinking about it, the, the young girl and her sister were the characters became characters in God's army later 
and the father was uh, he was battling alcoholism and he had thro a throat uh, cancer, I believe. But he needed a blessing, and there was there was one one particularly just powerful, beautiful blessing when he he uh, requested a blessing, and it was just such a beautiful moment, just full of love and light, and I really honestly felt like I was a conduit of something divine, and it was just just a beautiful experience. And there were things like that, you know, that would come along, and. Um, um, uh, Experiences of light and darkness, and well, you, you want to talk about this, and you know, you and I have talked because we're friends, and so one time we were sharing these odd experiences that we were having, and I, I do have an experience that uh, I don't want to go into it too deeply because it's actually going to crop up in a film uh, at a future point, in a very very crucial point. But just in broad strokes, uh, there was a period when I was, uh, I think I was about 16 years old, and my parents had moved away. They'd moved back to Kansas. I had decided to stay in Utah, so I was going to be like basically homeless, living with friends or whoever would take me in, so that I could finish high school. And I was uh, actually just spending the night in our vacant house, <clears throat> and my friend was there, and we were sleeping in the backyard. And I was feeling guilty about my teenage sins, you know, and my rebelliousness. And I go into the house to to uh, have a moment alone, so I could pray and and ask forgiveness. And it was it was a freaky experience that I've always uh, I'm still trying to kind of explain, but sitting, you know, knelt in a corner of an empty room, in the empty front room of this empty house, vacant house, started praying and decided I better pray out loud. So as I started to pray out loud, suddenly the, there was this, the doors, I mean, it was like, it was this, such an exaggerated um, event where it was like, there were two big double doors that were the front entrance to the house and they were just like, Throwing back and forth uh, like like some very large man was you know trying, trying to, to in. break in and it was just like bam, bam scared the hell out of me I mean just instantly and and um, you know I felt at the time as soon as that was happening it, there was there were picture windows that you could kind of I, I could have seen somebody there or, or at least a shadow of someone and there was nothing there scared the hell out of me and instantly I just felt like I was you know surrounded by some very malicious energy and so I just knew that. Something that, and, and uh, could have been in my mind, you know, it could have been generated by the fear of, of this and my instant interpretation that I was praying, trying to repent. Here was something really. Now you're odd about to have the Joseph Smith experience, right. maybe. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so I instantly interpreted, but, but I just felt that way and I felt like I had to get out. And so I just got up and, and you know, got my behind out of the house and went to my friend who was still asleep in the backyard and he was like, Welcome. I was. You know, terrified. By this time, I was just so terrified, and uh, then he Im immediately became terrified. And he was a, you know, he was LDS but not active at all. And so then, you know, I went around to the front to see if anything could have happened, just trying to find some physical explanation of what what had just happened. Of course, there's nothing there, and no one there, and it was just so. It was such a completely odd experience, and so I've often uh, tried to make sense of that because it really. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. I actually, about a year and a half ago, uh, found my friend again, and uh, he works up in Salt Lake. So I took him out for a beer, and we're sitting down, and I'm talking, and I'm saying, okay, now just for the, I explained that this experience is kind of fundamental, and it's still something that I'm grappling with, and in complete honesty, and I'm not going to get pissed off, even though I, I ran through that house so fast that there was no way he could have gotten from the front of the house all the way back into his sleeping bag by the time I was there, but still I'm thinking, was this a put on? If if it is, you got to tell me now because this has metaphysical implications, and uh, in my own life and in my work, and I need to know what the hell happened. And uh, so it was interesting that he, you know, and he's he just very, you know, years later, there's no reason for him to be continuing the BS. And he's like, no, I had I, I was as terrified as you were, and I had no idea what you know what was going on. And. Uh, so this is something I'm grappling with, and it was interesting that <clears throat> that the feeling of uh, this, this maliciousness was so real to me that, uh, that I actually felt bad about having run away. I felt bad about having left. You know, I felt like uh, this was I should have stayed. I should have let stayed. Let it play out. I should yeah. have let. I should have. What, where was this going to lead? You know, and if. Uh, um, 
and so I, I felt bad about that. And, and actually, as a missionary, I kind of sought out any experience. I thought if, if there was some opportunity to come in contact with a dark force, I wanted it, you know, because I didn't want to run away again. I just wanted to confront this, see it through. I felt, I felt bad about being so afraid, you know, being cowardly. I should have stuck it out. And uh, it was interesting, though, that little follow-up on that was there was a sister in our mission field. I was the district leader in a mission field in a little town in Mexico in Jalapa. And it was not a little town, but... Uh, and she became possessed of the devil. And so the mission president was, you know, a few hours away. So he just calls me on the phone. He's like, will you go cast the devil out of sister... I won't use her name because it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and, and I thought, okay, um, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess so. I guess that's what I'm here for, so... I'm off, so I'm getting ready. And I'm starting to sweat it because it's like, like I say, I, I had had a little experience with this, and I thought this is, maybe it's the showdown had finally happened. So, you know, I, I get there, my companion's with me. He's a native, and he's just sweating bullets because he doesn't want to go do battle with the, <laughs> adversary. the adversary. Yeah. And, uh, and so I go in there, and I think I'm ready, and I, I walk in the door and go into the, and the other sister missionary is freaked out. You know, she doesn't know what's going on. Leads me into the back room where the possessed sister is and she's of course doing the whole exorcist thing with you know rolling her head around making weird noises and I entered the room and and I actually they left you know the other two got the hell out of there because they didn't want to be any part of it so I'm left alone to cast Satan out <laughs> and uh, and I just, uh, there was nothing there, you know. It's like I, I you know, you knew what the feeling. I was, knew what the feeling would be, yeah. and it was completely absent. And it was just this woman acting weird in this room. There was no feeling of any like dark presence. There was no dark energy. There was no malicious. There was nothing, you know. And so, I just sat down next to her and I said, "Okay, uh, I've had a little experience with this, and you're not possessed. And I don't know what you're doing, but you're not possessed of the devil." And maybe you have emotional problems or psychological problems, but there's not, you know, there's there's no evil spirit here, so I'm not going to cast anything out. And I said I'll give you a blessing, because obviously you've got some issues and problems, but there's no. And she immediately, as soon as I said, you know, there's no Satan's not here. There's no evil spirits. It's just you and me. As soon as I said that, suddenly she stopped making all the weird noises and and the gyrations, and and then uh, gave her the blessing, and she thanked me, and and. Uh, I left, and then interesting, she did, she wasn't possessed again until I was transferred away, and then suddenly she became possessed of the devil again. But uh, but yeah, that was that was an interesting experience, and that that is a, a counter, or at least an addition to that story where um, that that original experience was at least genuine enough, even though I still can't explain it. It was genuine enough that that uh, I, I didn't fall for the bogus, you know, I'm being possessed kind of business. Uh, but it is my tendency now, uh, and I've got some, actually, some of my story ideas have to do with with uh, possession and uh, in a more philosophical way than just, you know, creepy, freaky stuff. But but uh, it is something that fascinates me and something that uh, I recognize I have a tendency to, you know, uh, again, I think it, it goes back to that experience of, of walking, of running away and thinking next time I'm not, you know, if if something like that ever happens again, I'm not running away. So, um, so anyway, so that that's that story, and that 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 was one of those. So when I speak about these experiences that were kind of formative, were very important. That's that's one of them, and the the Carthage experience is one of them. Some of the really beautiful experiences I've had, giving, mostly giving blessings to people, um, or or feeling just move the, a, a spiritual. Um, Confirmation or a or feeling of uh, some spiritual presence or approval or something, mm -hmm. uh, largely in a sense of community as I as I've ex examined them later. Um, or rec so, in terms of your story then as well as now, you would say that you're still open to the fact that there's an un unseen world that maybe has malicious characters in it, maybe doesn't. Uh, are, you just, are you just agnostic? On, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense for your... your, your I know, I know as, as, yeah. I've, as I've been answering your questions and talking about things, I think right up until this point, most people will be listening thinking, he sounds pretty Mormon to me, except for the, you know... Going and having a beer with your pe buddy. Pepper and buffet <laughs> and having a beer with my buddy. Um, but... Uh, 
Yeah, it's tricky. First of all, I think one of the things that I learned was a real humility about my beliefs because I was so certain I was right. I think we need to jump ahead and go and then come back to this. Okay, all right. Um, basically, but basically I think w the important things to know as I continue this narrative is that I was a very, I, I, I was about as, I was a true believer. I mean, just completely, um, especially, and then afterwards, and by the time we get to the, the period of God's army, I was, you know, I, I was I was willing ready and desirous to do whatever I felt the Lord wanted me to do. And I felt that would be within Mormonism. I felt like I was convinced that Mormonism was true. I was totally on board with the whole restoration of the gospel and all this kind of stuff. And as, as that, I was uh, very studious. I'd always been studious, but very studious. And I didn't want to know just the, I didn't want to know just the Deseret Book stuff, but I wanted to know what the anti-Mormons were saying so that when I would confront them outside of the Arizona temple when they're going crazy, that I could actually, you know, hold an intelligent debate. I guess you'd say. I wanted to know that. I wanted to know the answers. I want to know the problems. Um, I want to know everything. You know, history, doctrine, everything. I love Mormonism, everything about it, and it was very committed. And by this time in my life, I'd put. I mean, I'd even gotten to the point where my career uh, was so completely entwined with my professional life was so completely intertwined with Mormonism that it was basically complete and I was completely absorbed <laughs> and uh, so it was at this period <clears throat> this is what this is what uh, really gets to me is uh, there's this perception and this belief in fact shortly after I lost my belief I, I attended a sacrament meeting where this guy got up and said he pulled a quote from I can't remember which which prophet said it, but somebody said, you know, that you, the only reason you lose a testimony is because of sin. So somebody's lost their DNC testimony. DNC 84, somewhere in the 50s. That's okay, basically cool. a scripture. Yeah. Cool. And, uh, and I was just livid by this because I was experiencing it. I was dealing with the ramifications of it. And I went back, and it was, a it was like a stake high counselor. And so I went up to one of the bishopric members and I was like, Do you, are you going to like counter this? Or is this? He's like, no, what's the counter? You know, you lose a testimony because you sin. And I was just like, ah! You guys don't know anything, um, but basically, what what had happened was, uh, whew, um, well, basically, what it is an answer to a prayer, which was, uh, I had just gotten to the point where I was feeling like I, I knew enough about. <clears throat> about the church history and the church doctrines and stuff. And I got to a point where I was seeing a real discrepancy between... And I, was, I was having a hard... I was always one of the... I, I felt like one of the church's best apologists because I could come up with an answer for anything. You know, I mean, there wasn't a problem in the church. Uh, there, there, were, there were just a couple that I really didn't have an intelligent <laughs> response for. But I could come up with an answer for anything. Even I got to the, I mean, the blacks and the priesthood, pff, that was an easy one. Well, and you were, you were putting it in the Elder Dalton character in God's Army. You were, yeah, very you much were so. responding to the multiple yeah. accounts of the first vision. Yeah, very much you know, so. All those yeah. different things. I felt like I could handle pretty much anything. And, and I, you know, I did get to the point where, you know, there were things I, that even I struggled with, but I, you know, like the uh, Orson Hyde situation when he goes off to the, you know, to dedicate the Holy Land. And while he's gone, Joseph hooks up with his wife. Attempts and, to. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was, you know, that was one that it took me a few days, even as the master apologist. But I came up with a great response. It's like, oh, okay, I can make peace with this. Okay, great, I see it. Now I see it differently. And um, just for the record, I thought it, it just made perfect sense because to Joseph, you know, the, you know, any authority other than priesthood authority was imaginary. It didn't exist. So just like a baptism that was done by someone without priesthood authority didn't have any any validity, a marriage that was not performed by the priesthood had no validity either. It's just a couple people living together and thinking they were married. And so it, unless it was a, a ceiling by the priesthood, they weren't really married. So, and it, so it was a great little answer. And it actually, um, I was pretty proud of myself for coming up with that one because I hadn't heard anybody else uh, do that. But anyway, so the point being, I was into all this, into everything. And there were things that, that uh, it was like this enormous... Um, a way to describe it, and this is difficult because I really have spoken about it so little, 
So I apologize if I'm not being really clear, but it was just like a, it was like this big construct or a big structure in my mind where, you know, there's this big edifice that was being built, and you know, some pieces of the edifice weren't quite finished yet, but it was all holding together pretty well, and there were problems. There were some serious problems, but the whole thing was still generally pulling together pretty well. But I got to the point where it was like, okay, but I, I get to this point where it's like. Do I align myself more with the teachings of original Mormonism, do or do I align myself more with the the church as it is today? And despite what people will say, anybody who knows anything about church history and doctrine will know that the church of 2010 is dramatically different than the church of 1843. I mean, dramatically different. They're they're al I mean they're mm -hmm. almost unrecognizable. And in between, that, and in between, lots of blah, different blah, 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 blah. Mormonism sphere. Right, and so, but you get to that certain point, and my commitment was really to Joseph Smith, you know, the Joseph Smith Brigham Young era, the whole restoration idea, and, and I was seeing these things that I didn't understand. Were how does the restoration of all? It was becoming quite the opposite of the restoration of all things. It's like, as soon as Brigham Young died, it was almost like let's get rid of this stuff as fast as we can. Um, <clears throat> so it was the opposite of restoration. Um, and yet, maybe there was some divine purpose in that, and so I was willing to go with that, you know, and you know, and the whole deal. But it was the point where I was praying to get serious answers, and I was praying in the way that, you know, in every way that we're taught to pray. Serious temple goer, um, um, true order of prayer, regular order, the pedestrian order of prayer. I don't know what you call it, the untrue <laughs> order of prayer. But, but, but I was praying in every way possible to get answers. And the answer was, where, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Because I will go anywhere. I'll do anything. I mean, I, honestly, to the point where um, if I had received an answer that I was to be a fundamentalist and that the Lord wanted me to take another couple of wives and knowing that that would destroy my marriage or whatever, I was still, it was like, I want to do what God wanted me to do, whatever that was. That's the point that I was at for a long period of time. And I was living as close to the church I guess you'd say the ideal, the Mormon ideal, as you could. You know, I was trying to, you know, be as good, honest, moral in every way. I, I was living as as upright a life as I think you could say, even including my missionary days. I was right down the line. I guess I was seeing some R-rated movies, so that was the that was the whole problem. <laughs> you know. A little secret but, sin. It <laughs> wasn't secret. I was perfectly willing to announce that to anybody. But point being. So I'm in this phase and I'm praying and then and then uh, it was the it was the oddest and most unexpected thing truly unexpected is I, it was after prayer and after uh, some study scripture study and I was sitting in my room in my bedroom I was sitting in bed and just pondering things thinking about about everything and and for whatever reason I I just. Uh, I just asked myself, it, it was like a, a very, and I, I think it was the first time I sincerely had asked myself this question since I was 14 years old, but I, you know, trying to make sense of everything and, and not getting an answer, being used to answers taking a long time, but still not getting an answer, and, and finally I, I just asked myself, well, what if it's not true? What if it's not true? And I meant, in my mind, it was just like, and it was a sincere question, it was, it was, I was open to whatever the answer would be, and I was just like, what if it's all not true? And by that I meant everything, you know, the Joseph Smith story, the restoration, um, and opening myself up to that question, and there was, uh, um, the most unprecedented thing happened for me, which was, I had always heard people talk in church about hearing a voice. And I didn't understand what that meant. You know, they always like a, they. It was as if I could. It was actual voice. You know, speaking to me. And I, I didn't have anything like that. In fact, if anything, I was at this at this moment. I was expecting because of my Mormon instruction to be getting a, uh, something from outside. You know, you get the voice from outside. You get an angel. You get something that comes from outside. But for me, what happened was I heard a voice. But it was my own voice, and I had never heard it before. And it, it was, uh, and, it's, and it's certainly not this clear, but it was, it was from the very deepest part of me, the most, the most pure, the most fundamental part of me was the answer that said, of course it's not true. It was just, 
and and it was and it was and I just instantly recognized that this was not something from outside. This was this was me that I'd never really. Um, it's hard to describe, but it's like a, something that I'd never really heard so clearly. But it was like a voice, but it was my voice, and it was of course it's not true. And as soon as I I really heard that. It was instantaneous. You know, it was just like instant. Suddenly, this entire construct that I had in my mind just instantly started to, and it just came down. And I instantly understood that all the problems that I was having, that this one answer answered every. It answered every problem. <clears throat> Everything that didn't make sense. Every every problem. Every. Uh, it was it was the answer, you know. It was like, of course, it's not true, and of course, I knew that, and and I don't know how long I had known that and been carrying it around, but I, in the deepest part of me, I knew that. So, it was it was absolutely instantly the most terrifying and awful moment of my life. It was uh, um, I went from literally from ten seconds before being a true believer to that moment knowing that I knew absolutely nothing. And that everything I believed and knew about the universe, about my life, my existence, everything, or the world, every, everything was gone. And I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. And, and I described it to the few people that I've spoken with it about, I've described it as, uh, I think I'm, maybe I'm just a visual, very visual, but it really felt, you know the, the movies, you know, the science fiction movies where they're in space and two ships disengage and one of them just starts to drift away. Um, the, you know, force of the, natural forces pulling it away and they're never going to come back to you. And that's what I literally, I felt like something was, le like a piece of me was leaving and that I was, n that it would never, it would only get farther away and I would never get it back. And uh, and that was my belief or my faith, I guess people would say, uh, um, but more more I think my belief because I still, I still retain faith but not, but not a belief in, in Mormonism. But, and that's basically what happened, and it's such an internal thing, but such a powerful thing, but it's very hard to describe what happened, but I just knew, just like people would say. And, I, and the, re, the way I would describe it is just how Joseph Smith came in from the woods, told his mother, I've learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. I learned for myself at that moment that Mormonism is not true. And as I say that, I want to clarify that I'm not making some universal pronouncement or statement. This is the way that I believe, and as I continue to talk about this, um, I, I don't want people to... This is it's my point of view, and I could be wrong, because that's one thing I learned was a real humility about my beliefs, because I was such... I believe so firmly, and now I believe so firmly that, no, it's not true. Um, but anyway, the the trying to communicate the the kind of the terror that you feel after that moment. Um, most people that I've spoken to that have lost their belief have lost it like piece by piece by piece, a little bit, or they never really believed. But and then eventually they just leave. But to me, it was just like it was like a breaking point, and 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 it was absolutely terrifying. I mean, it really was because I had no idea what it meant. How, what am I supposed to do now? And at the point, I think it, I was in my late thirties, so. 39, I think. And so, you know, to be 39 years old and suddenly realize that you don't know anything about the universe and about you, um, about yourself, and everything that you've done before has been based on, you know, what I then understood to be a fantasy. Again, for myself, I understood it to be a fantasy. Um, <clears throat> that meant that, how am I going to raise my kids? How am I going to, what am I going to do now? I'm a Mormon filmmaker and I don't believe in Mormonism anymore. And uh, so, where is this in the <clears throat> lineup of your films? This was this was. Uh, I was trying to pinpoint the exact date. It was it was sometime in like September. I, I believe it was like September of uh, two thousand and three, two thousand three, because it was shortly before uh, getting the financing to make States of Grace. And so, I actually was so grateful for because I, I was literally like a zombie after that for a little while. I was like, what? I mean, what do I do? Just putting one foot in front of another, it was like, what's the point? Where am I going? What, what do I do? Um, and it was so, I was so grateful to get, be able to make that film because it gave me something to do, you know, something physically to do. And I still, you know, so I, as I went into making States of Grace, 
there was so much work to do that it, that it really kept me occupied. So as I was trying to process this, what had happened and what I was going to do about it, and I, I still knew that, you know, it's like, okay, I'm still good with Jesus, and um, I'm still good with uh, God, and um, and I still, you know, Mormonism has been such a positive experience for me, so I, I felt okay about making the film, and uh, I felt better about making Falling because it was just, I was in such a, I mean, and there, there was such a feeling of despair and depression and, and uh, uh, impending tragedy that, that I, I felt more at home <laughs> making that, I think, uh, than the other. But, uh, but that's where it fell in line, and, and that's where I went from, and the, from that time until now, it's been a gradual, um, not, not my, my level of belief has not changed, but it's been trying to manage that and trying to, um, trying to understand what I do believe, what I do think is real, what I do value, and what's good, and what do I do with these experiences that I had, uh, and, and it's, that happened it's, within a Mormon context, basically. Exactly. But yet, you still don't want to deny that they happened. Exactly. I can't deny that they happened. Won't deny that they happened. Uh, and the thing for me is very important that I reality is a huge thing for me. It's like I know some people have a really flexible view on reality, and you know the reality is what you make it. And I, I tend more towards a you know there are certain things that are true and that are real, and yeah, there's some flexibility in that and whatever. But but you know, I'm I'm pretty practical when it comes to, you know, if you know if you run out in the front of a bus, you're going to get killed by the bus, you know, and the bus is real, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so to me, and and there were things. I mean, it's tons of questions, you know, and and the psychology after having been in Mormonism for basically 30 years, a little over 30 years by that point, was there are things in your brain you don't even know they're there, you know. But I mean. I, I was so confused by what to do afterwards. It was like I knew that it wasn't true, and I knew that I would always know that it's not true. And it's hard to describe, but it's just, I just knew it. Difference between true and good? I mean, you were, you were able to still say it's good? Uh, no, that's or a question. Not. Is it good? If it's not true, is it good? No matter what good it does, is it good? It's all these, all these questions that were rolling around. Did I, you know, at first it was like my, um, I've lost my, in fact, one of the, uh, as a, one of the hardest parts about making falling was because everything else was, you know, everything I was so spent on every level. But there was a, there's a scene in that film when my character, it's after a lot of awful stuff has happened, and he, he parks his car and he puts a gun in his mouth and he is uh, attempting suicide. And I uh, didn't think, as an actor, I didn't want to go too much into this scene before I just wanted to shoot it, you know, just do the scene and see what happened. And uh, I, I didn't go into too much about what. What, the, what I would be thinking, what the character would be thinking, or what I, as, an, as, as me, Richard, would be thinking in order to generate that kind of grief and despair. Um, and so um, I kept putting it off until I had to do it. You know, I was pulling the car up and doing the scene, and right before I did it, I thought, all right, I know what I'm going to do, because I was so torn up about the fact that my son... Give me the gun, I'll do the scene. My son, Eli, was uh, about to be baptized, or he was about to turn eight, so. And I knew that I couldn't baptize him. You know? I just knew that it wasn't a worthiness issue. It was, uh, I didn't believe it, I couldn't do it. There's no way I was gonna pretend to believe and do this, and so I knew that I'd have to uh, sit down with him and say, and try to explain to him why he's the first son that doesn't get baptized by his father. And uh, just tore me up so much that it was like, pfft, easy, put the gun in my mouth, love to kill myself, not have to deal with this, you know, this kind of pain. Um, so it worked great for the scene. Fortunately, by the time I actually had to have the conversation, I was much more at peace with it than I was then. But that's the kind of thing that, I, that the, psychologically I was going through, you know, it's the same thing, it's like, this, you know, you're gonna lose your family forever, and then it's like I don't even believe this anymore. Why is this torturing my mind that I might be, you know, that I'm, that I'm going to lose my family forever? I'm gonna be the the link that you know generate, and it's like I don't even believe this anymore. But the the talons are still in your brain, you know, and you can't get them out. It's the craziest thing. So it was the hardest thing. It's like, are my sons gonna serve missions? And even though my mission was like this amazing and wonderful experience, 
I want, do I, I want my sons to do this? No, I don't. It, I mean, it goes on for a very long time afterwards. Anybody that's been through this experience, I think, can, can relate. But, uh, but uh, I, I think that's, uh, there were so many things in this period, people thinking that it was an easy thing to do. And when I did, the people that were close to me that knew that I was leaving the church, um, you know, those kind of accusations where you're taking the easy way out. It's like, you have no idea. I have to now you put know. the whole universe back together. Right. <laughs> and you think that's easy? for Yeah, I have yeah. to keep my sanity and I have to raise a family. I have to make a living. And most of all, I have to be, I, I can't ignore this. I can't pretend that it didn't happen. I can't, that's not the way that my brain works, you know. <clears throat> and so, so yeah, it's been a real, it's been a, a real difficult pro, uh, experience. But fundamentally, that's what happened for me. It's like I just instantly somehow knew that it wasn't true. And so I've had to kind of deal with that since then. Um, and that, yeah, that's colored my work. It's colored, uh, well, it's colored everything. You know, it's been a big game changer. Everybody's interested about how that, that has worked with my family. Everybody that speaks to me is like instantly, well, you know, how is it, with, if they know Gwen, you know, it's like, well, how's Gwen dealing with it? And how's your wife, if they don't know her, how's your wife dealing with it? Everybody's very interested because it's interesting. But uh, that was difficult too because um, it took, I, I didn't tell her immediately. It was, it was a process of, okay, first of all, being able to talk about it, just trying to process what had happened to some degree, and then finally getting to the point where I did start to talk about it. And it, you know, it wasn't easy. It was, uh, we'd never, um, we'd always had a really close relationship, and, um, but this was probably the closest we ever came to having real arguments was this was going to disrupt everything. And she, uh, to her eternal credit, you know, she, she always was, I could tell that even when it was difficult, she was trying to be supportive, trying to be empathetic, understand what I was going through. Um, and but she was resistant because she it was very clear where this was going to go, you know. And uh, and I can't from the other horror stories I've heard about how other marriages have gone. Mine was mine was great. You know, it didn't it, it was not easy, but <clears throat> she was supportive and she wanted to continue to go to church. But but you know she continued to love me and you know be affectionate and supportive in every way that she possibly could. So it was it was really ideal. But I do remember one, the one kind of discussion when things got really into the thick of it, and I really felt like she might not um, find peace with this, and it might become a problem, like a real problem in our marriage. There was one point when we were talking, and I, I remember saying something, which I was glad I said it, because it really expressed it well, but it was like, <clears throat> you know, Maybe you you love you know this guy that lived 170 years ago more than you love me, referring to Joseph Smith, and I think that really, really stuck, and and that was probably one of the last difficult conversations we had about it. Was um, I don't know if that was as memorable to her as it was to me, but it was very much it was like yeah, are you gonna you know are you really gonna choose some guy that you know died 160 years ago instead of your own husband who's here or, right now. And that, that translates a lot of times in, in the gay and lesbian same-sex thing is, are you going to choose, we have a relationship, but you're going to choose a, a story, an overarching narrative, a right. theory over this concrete relationship right. that we have. Yeah, it's, it's a very choosing, powerful... Uh, choose an institution over, yeah. over me. Um, but no, she didn't. And uh, um, to get caught up on the story, when I wrote the the uh, exit uh, manifesto in 2007, she was still active in the church and I was still supportive of that. Although at that time I was getting to the point where I no longer wanted my kids going to church because I was starting to realize like I don't want them to have to go through what I'm going through now. Sooner sooner to get out the better was my... What would you have replaced it with? Had you put enough of the world together that you really felt like I can help them feel oriented within the universe. Yeah, without well, that, that was a long process happening, but uh, but now they're you know they're not attending anymore. No, nobody in the nobody, family, no. Gwen included. No, my uh, 
my youngest, who's going to turn eight in a, in a little bit, came to me this morning and was wanting to be baptized because everybody in the neighborhood is getting baptized. And uh, so I told him, um, well, you know, we'll talk about this, but how do you feel about getting baptized in a, in a river? Do you want to get baptized in a river, in a lake? You know, wouldn't that be a lot more fun? So maybe I'll just go out and baptize him. Um, <laughs> so he'll have the experience and have the family there for the support. But, uh, that he's committing his life to good values and stuff rather than a specific right, right, membership right. within. Right. Well, this is something. This was really difficult for me because, again, I'd had a good experience. So complex, you know. It's like, like I say, um, it, it's so intertwined. It's so mixed. One, one thing that really creeped me out was uh, as I was trying to figure out, do I want my kids there? Do I not? And I was letting them go, and I would pick them up at church sometimes. I, I didn't go unless you know somebody was doing something. I tried to avoid it because I just didn't want to be there anymore. Um, but one time going to pick up the kids and walking past the primary room and hearing all the you know hearing 60 kids in there all all singing follow the prophet follow the prophet and and I, it it just seriously creeped me out it just really made me feel like i was just walking past the brainwashing room <laughs> and uh and that really changed and then i started to see and then you know everything this this all the repetitiveness and it, and and all the it, there's so much baggage that goes along with it that yeah I had you have a great community and you hear some good things you know being nice to people and all the basic teachings of Jesus which you know I am totally on board with but it comes along with so much baggage so much guilt over unnecessary things so much fantasy so much believing in things that aren't true that I made the decision that I I really wanted to kind of encourage my children out of it eventually. I mean, at first I wanted them there because they, of course, they had to be there. But then later I got to the point where it's like I wanted to kind of encourage them out. And it got to the point where my oldest son, who's 19 now, pulled him aside a few months ago and just said, So, just want to make, and he's not active in the church, but I just said, So, how are you feeling? Is a mission at all on your radar? Are you thinking about that? And he said, "Oh no!" I was like, "Oh good, <laughs> thank you." <laughs> um, which is which is interesting, and it and it seem and it may seem weird to some people because I had such a good mission myself, but I, that was me, and he's him, and his life's going to be different, and and uh, I really um, that that torturous those torturous days after my loss of belief when I thought that I was going to be damaging my children eternally has led to a belief that I, I'm doing the best thing that I can for my kids because, I, again, I want them to embrace all truth, all goodness. I want them to be good people. But one of the things that, one of the great realizations that I had, um, and there's so many things you don't, you don't even understand about your own mind when you're in the middle of it, but um, it, it was, wasn't until I got out, got out of it and started just seeing, looking at humanity in general, and I was very distrustful, of course, of any other religion so uh, I was still interested in obviously anything but and I knew you read the Krishnamurti and and you know yeah any institutional yeah. stuff is gonna be a, a yeah. cloud you know yeah Krishnamurti why, why, was very influential yeah mm. why carry the boat that helped me get across the river around with me right you know and if, I, if I've made it over there um, right yeah the goal Krishnamurti really. was fantastic actually that was a a book that I just found randomly in Santa Monica when I was shooting States of Grace and I needed something to, I wanted something spiritual um, and I just never heard of the guy and picked it up and started reading it and it really, really resonated with me. So that was really think influential. Think on These Things, is that the one? Yeah, Think yeah. on These Things, uh, Krishnamurti. Mm -hmm. And uh, then later actually, then reading um, William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience, was also helped me make sense of some things of how I was interpreting experiences uh, according to how I'd been programmed to interpret them. Uh, that was really enlightening and and good. But uh, yeah, I guess that's the only thing. I don't know how how well I've communicated that, but that period of uh, um, it's been a it's been a it's still a difficult time. I I I miss the certainty. You know, I miss the uh, feeling that I'm right. <laughs> I miss the uh, security of knowing what's going on in the universe because right now you ask where I am now and, and do I believe in God? Yes, I do. 
But that's as far as I'll go with it. If somebody has said, what, what's he it like? I, I have no idea. I don't even know if it's a he, you know? Um, I, I feel like I've made contact with God in my life several times. Um, but I don't presume to even begin to, to expound on, on, on what, what, it, what he is. And I'll use well, the term he because... Would, but I, you would believe that God's personal or you would say, I don't even know if it's a personal, I do not a even personal know that. being or a... Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't but put somehow it the, there, there's some expansiveness to the universe that you've touched. You can't deny that you've touched right. it. And if that, that would be maybe what you'd call God or at least right. that's the minimal... Right. You know. I mean, I know there's something mm -hmm. there... Um, and I'll continue to, and, and you know, and um, I mean, I've gone back to, in fact, I tried to uh, engage you and some other friends in a conversation one time where I was trying to take us back to the original, what, what is basic, what is, if we just start from the very basics to try to understand what God is. And I was, I was proposing this whole idea that the only um, way to, I mean, what do we, how do we start to try to find God is, to me, it was like looking at his, the, the expressions of God or of creation. So to me it was life, it was you know, nature, human beings and dogs and camels and everything. Uh, trees, mosquitoes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's taking life and then it's like, if I was trying to understand a, a creator, an artist, I'd look at what he had created and that might give us clues to who or what or how he is. So that was kind of my approach at the time was like, you know, trying to just look at reality, look at life, um, not just life, but you know, death and and the decay. Uh, it's all a part of God, if there if there is a God. So all of that was uh, um, kind of, and and, it, and it, I guess to a certain extent, it's still where I am now because um, I do believe in life and good. I had one experience that's worth noting that helped me understand some of what. Uh, <clears throat> some of my own spiritual experiences and it was unexpected this was after falling maybe a year or so after I'd shot falling so it had been a little while and I hadn't had a lot of spiritual experiences because after this crash it was mostly just despair and and uh, so I had another unexpected experience where my wife and I had gone to Washington DC just to get away to have a have a nice time so we were hitting the museums and stuff, and we thought, oh, let's go hit the Lincoln Memorial because why not? It's Lincoln Memorial. you got to see it. It's the coolest place there. <laughs> so we went to the Lincoln Memorial, and we walk in, and I'm, I, I'm there, and I'm looking around, and you know, you got your little bus tours walking around, and I'm looking at this huge statue, and it's beautiful. It's just incredibly well done, powerful and big. And I'm looking at that, and I'm looking up at the walls, and they've got, I think it's the Gettysburg Address that's etched into the walls. And then the second inaugural is yeah. on the other wall, right. And I'm reading these words, and I'm there, and there's something about this whole thing and, and the, the ideas that, that he's talking about, the ideals that he's talking about. And I just have this experience that's very much what I would call a spiritual experience. I, I felt this, this contact with something other, something higher, something beautiful, something completely good and, and moved you know emotionally because that, that's kind of my reaction when I when I make that connection there's something that's just that kind of melts me because it's so beautiful and uh, and so I had and, and I instantly go wait a minute I am having a spiritual experience <laughs> and and what is this but it was interesting because I walked away very it was it was a wonderful experience and I was grateful for it but I walked away I think a little wiser than I was when I had previously had spiritual experiences because I didn't I didn't walk away going this experience means that that God approves of America and the, you know, <laughs> everything the, that America does right. in the free world is uh, right yeah. right right and therefore George W Bush is a true president <laughs> never nothing like that it was walked in fact it made me think and I started to process that and I started to realize that what that experience was was my me kind of reaching out to these these beautiful ideals and beautiful ideas and um, uh, these very noble things that and, and so my spirit kind of reaching out for that and and somehow making some kind of contact with the 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 beauty of those and the power and the goodness of those ideas and so um, I went back and I started looking at my experiences in Mormonism and I was like oh yeah that's what that was again it was within a Mormon context but I was still. Reach, I mean, it was still the this 
the ideas of community or the ideas of love. You know, I put my hands on a woman's head and, and just very love, I mean, open myself up and just with all the love that I could possibly have, try to, try to help this person. Naturally, you know, you're, you're going to have a great experience because it's an experience of love. And, and, and then I started to put all this stuff together and realize that all of these things, even that experience in Carthage Jail where I was, um, again, I was opening myself up to, you know, the, the ideals of, you know, the, the bravery and the courage of this prophet and him, you know, willing to give his life and, and all this, these very noble things. I was being moved by that. Um, and, and, and then as I stepped back, I started to realize that a lot of these things that I had always, that I had always assumed to be the, in the domain of the religions, um, because they claim them, you know, the institutionalized religions claim virtue as if it's theirs, morality is theirs, um, chastity is theirs, um, everything, anything that's good, um, they, they somehow here. <laughs> pull it under their yeah, tent, yeah, you know, yeah, as yeah. if it originated yeah, there. Right. And I started to realize that all these these virtues were human virtues, that the religions had co-opted them, but that they they were really human virtues. Goodness is a human virtue, you know. The, so you don't put that virtue into the fabric of the universe somehow. It's enough for you at this point to say it's a human virtue. Uh, Ooh, well, that's a good question. I don't know. Goodness of the fabric of the universe. That's a great question that we should talk about sometime because I see a lot of darkness and, and maliciousness, or at least mind, mindless malice in the universe. Okay. Um, I don't no know. overarching arc of the universe luring No, I don't know about that. In to, fact, to, this is one of the things about God that, that concerns me and I was always somewhat aware of. And it really hit me after the tsunami um, when when that was big news and everybody was sending money and everybody was praying and concerned. There was one experience in particular that stuck out for me because I was in a church and they were talking about this, two, I think a toddler, like a two-year-old or something that had been found floating on a door and so the toddler had been saved and talking about how God had saved this toddler and, and I remember at the time just being like, are you kidding me? It's like, why don't we start talking about the hundreds of toddlers that not only in a tsunami but in all the African genocides and it's like let's start talking about that because that's just as much an expression of God as the little toddler who's found there and so that's definitely something that I take into consideration when I'm thinking about um, God it's like for every every saved person there's a lot of tragedy and ugliness and that's got to be taken into account you know that's part of God if anything is and if anything is so so yeah do I believe in God yes and I don't know anything about him. Um, um, I love goodness, and I mean those are still those things are still so much a um, something I strive for, and those those experiences are still I'm still reaching for the for the good things. I I, I recognize that I become a little more cynical, um, very much more skeptical. Um, I. Uh, I'm open. Yeah, that's a that's the best way to describe my my where I'm at right now is I'm very open, but I'm very skeptical, even about my own experience. This crazy experience with uh, you know, malicious forces when I was 16, where it's like uh, I'm open to the fact that that was a genuine experience, and that there are malicious forces that wanted to destroy me at that point. But I'm also very aware that it's very possible that. Uh, something very real happened and I, you know, interpreted it in this way or that uh, I was a teenager, I was a crazy teenager who knows what Hormonal. energies are flowing around, <laughs> yeah. maybe. Okay. You know, so I don't know, I don't know, but uh, but yeah, I'm open. I'm still very much, I'm still searching, but I'm doing it with a, a real caution. Yeah. Because um, so you're still seeking spiritual experience or this wider connection or, you know, right. truth and ideal. Um, any spiritual practices that you've kept up? Uh, prayer, meditation, con you know, deep contemplation, nature walk. I mean, what is it? That you're, I love the line um, for those Mormon stories listeners. Maybe Tom Kimball and I did a three-parter on stages of faith, and one of the really favorite lines for me is the the founder of stages of faith, uh, James Fowler. Tom asked him a question one day when he came to Sunstone. And Tom says, you know, everybody's having these spiritual experiences and I'm not having them. And he goes, well, uh, what are you doing to put yourself in a position where you'd have those? 
In other words, you can't get hit by a train unless you put yourself near the railroad tracks. And so I'm just saying, you know, it sounds, I, I know uh, listeners, those of you, uh, Fred, Richard and I hang out at least once a month, you know, probably for the last five, six years. Um, I know you're, you're, you're actively pursuing a spiritual path, mm-hmm. even though it's not necessarily a Mormon path. But what practices have you found to be the most helpful? And uh, Awareness, I think, is probably the, the biggest. Um, I honestly think every day for me is kind of a spiritual experiment, or at least an observation. I'm trying to process everything and still this is fundamentally what is fundamentally most important to me is uh, is figuring it out and, uh, and not in the sense that I'm going to figure it out because I don't believe I don't have that kind of an ego to think that I'm going to figure this out it's like I'm the the created cannot understand the creator mm-hmm. that'd kind of be my point of view but I think it's my job to, to to try to live the most genuine and authentic life I can is to try to align myself with realities, whether they're, you know, universal realities, spiritual realities, all realities, um, is very important. And so, uh, yes, I pray, not as often as uh, as I think a religious person would expect one to pray, but I, I think I approach life in somewhat of a very prayerful, reverent way, um, hopefully uh, open-eyed, clear-eyed kind of way. Um, Fasting every now and again, I'll do that because I, I kind of, you know, but that's more of a, just a, you know, a religious extremity or an extreme religious practice. That's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, generally I just say an, an awareness and an openness, seeking, ready, uh, I jump down. You know, if I, if I see a <clears throat> clue somewhere, I'm instantly yeah. after it because um, it's... A preoccupation, to yeah, say the it least. These, yeah, matters. These types of things matter to you. And sure. also, the I mean, filmmaking for me and writing, it's a, it's a way for me to continue, and it's still that way for me. I mean, it's still very much a, I want to, I'll chase after stories or elements of stories that I don't understand, that I have questions about, uh, that I want to explore. And so uh, this film, now that I'm doing this triptych film, it's very much one of these kind of films that's helping me to explore some things, some spiritual concerns uh, that I and some questions that I don't have answers to and so so that's very helpful um, and, uh, and that's why it's very important for me to uh, maybe I mean ultimately maybe that's uh, the filmmaking is a is a spiritual, spiritual discipline practice, yeah, yeah it's a yeah, yeah. absolutely good um, so you've already mentioned that you missed the certainty but Overall, you're happier than you were. I, I don't so know. So you're happier. happier today than you were in 2000 when God's Army was released and it was purely open-hearted, sincere, sincere movie. No, no, I'm not happier. Um, I think in a, I think I was happier um, in the certainty. Um, I mean, who wouldn't be happier when you know that you're going to live? You know, you're going to live forever. You know that you're going to be creating worlds. You know that you'll have your children with you forever, your wife with you forever. Um, Great story. Yeah. Yeah, and then you go to a point where you now you know that what you have now may be it, and so it makes it makes life so much more precious. I mean, it certainly does. Um, and uh, you realize that if you're going to have relationships with your kids or your family, you, you do it now because that may, that's most likely it, you know. And uh, but no, not not happier. But I'm 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 I'd rather be here um, because now I'm living in reality as I perceive it. And it's a painful reality at times. I mean, it, the, that that kind of pain doesn't go away. That kind of loss. I, I miss the community. You know, I miss the I miss the beauty of some of the doctrines that that I no longer believe. I miss you know, I miss the people. I miss uh, I miss going to the temple. I I loved going to the temple. I miss you know so much of it. But for me, as soon as I realized that it wasn't true, I couldn't stay. You know, I've had people ask me. In fact. Uh, one of our mutual friends one night, when I, I think I was complaining 
about the fact how difficult it is for me now to try to raise money because so many people are prejudiced against me because they know that I've left the church. And, and then our friend said, well, you did that to yourself. And I've, I'm still irritated about that, you know? It's like, well, hold on, back up. What, am I supposed to, was I, was I supposed to pretend to believe in order to raise money? In which case, what the hell is that? What kind of a person would I be? What kind of integrity would I have in order to do that? In fact, that's when Those I, questions were on the ones posed for me to ask you today. Have you ever been tempted since, no, since this tempted, happened no. uh, to I honestly, stick around and pretend? Yeah. Oh, Lord, I cannot imagine. Uh, the, one of the reasons I eventually had to um, go public with my own beliefs was just that. I could not live with... I would have people stopping me in the grocery store... Um, telling me about their sons who were going on missions and and how much my f stuff had my work had inspired them and telling me all these other spiritual experiences very open, and I was at a point I was at a very different point. They were making assumptions which were understandable. I'm talking to Elder Dalton here, man. <laughs> exactly, and uh, and I was you know in a different place, and I would find myself at restaurants, and I'd want a glass of wine, so I'd order a glass of wine, but then I'd notice that somebody was over there looking at me funny because they knew who I was, and here I was drinking wine, and they thought you know, and instantly it was like, okay, I'm not a hypocrite, and I don't want to be perceived as such, and so I needed to come out and just tell everybody where I was. Um, and also I felt I owed it to the community, you know. It was part of that openness. I'd always been open with my work, and I was also open in other ways. But it's, uh, uh, especially when you live in a community where you work, it was, it was important for me to at least, you know, respect that relationship enough to say, okay, this is where I am. This is what I believe. Um, so, but to, to have stayed, you know, for people to, to think that I would, you know, pretend to believe or keep going to church so that I could raise money, so that I could provide for my family, I'd rather not, you know. Um, so to me, uh, even the question to me is, it gets me going because it's like, how could I do that? You know, how could I, how, how could I have any integrity and do that? And uh, that's been one of the hardest things is one of the hard things about, having the experience that I had was realizing that I was going to, I was going to lose, every, potentially lose everything. I could lose my family. I would certainly lose, at least my career would have to be drastically reorganized. I would lose the respect and affection of a lot of people. And uh, basically it was a bunch of loss and it was all, um, and it all hinged on that, uh, that, you know. That voice inside. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, being true to truth. That that was an ironic thing for me. Was in Mormon, you know, Mormonism instilled in me such a focus on truth. You know, truth is paramount. Truth is everything, and that that is Mormonism. You know, truth, and you you accept the truth. Mm -hmm. And it never occurred to me that at some point I would have to choose between truth and Mormonism. But that day for me did come, and I chose truth. And so, and everything else has been just a domino effect after that. But I'm still glad I made the decision because I really don't see what a viable alternative would have been. Um, I see others who, I talk to a lot of people who don't believe, but they keep, because of family or whatever, they keep going through the motions. And that's not me. I, I understand why they're doing that, but that's not me. I can't, I couldn't do that. And of course, I'm speaking from a point of view where I don't have a lot of family that's LDS, so... Um, I lost, you know, a lot of friends. I lost um, a lot of business contacts. But not but, the uh, generations back. But not the generations yeah, back, yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. Well, and you know, I've made a different choice th than you. We've, we've talked about my journey, too, in many ways very similar to yours. But uh, I've, I've managed to find reasons to stay that aren't... Right. Aren't simple in any way, and so right. Uh, right. so I, I've always felt respected by you for those choices, and I hope you've always felt respected by me, and and certainly by this audience that are yeah. are listening to you now. Um, there is one thing that I want that's important for me to cover, and I hope a few people are still listening now because uh, I tried I've tried to make this very clear from the beginning, but um, when I left, even though I tried to be very clear without being too specific right. about about things, uh, there was instantly the perception that I had left. Because, well, of course, the same old reason. Somebody offended me, uh, but mostly people said I was angry because people weren't going to my movies, <laughs> yeah. and so I and, and I, 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 every opportunity I could get, I tried to clarify that this was not the case, and, but it still persists as being you know people. There's still this this uh, 
perception out there that I left Mormonism because uh, people weren't going to my movies. And that, that, that is so incredibly offensive to me because if I were that shallow of a human being that I would abandon my you know, spiritual home because people weren't going to my movies, I, I would be an idiot, I'd be a fool, an imbecile, and, and it was so much not the case. And as, as I pointed out before, even though the films didn't do as well, Still, they, they did pretty well for an independent film, um, for independent films, even States of Grace, which only made a couple hundred thousand dollars at the box office. For an independent film, that's still pretty good. And, um, and there, was, you know, there was an appreciative audience. There were people that did go good, to the film. Good critic, and, yeah, reviews every time. Re reviews and a, and a large audience that still loved the films. And so that was so much not in my mind. And was I, did I want more people to see my films? Absolutely. Did I? Did that drive me out of the church? Absolutely not, you know. And so, um, and yet, and yet, that's what I still get. Most of all, it's like he left because he was he's angry because people didn't go see his movies. I was like, are you a moron? You know, I'm because that that is so not so not true. So, Richard, uh, uh, thanks for talking so much about your your journey within Mormonism. One just point of clarification that a couple of people asked on the on the questions that they send in ahead of time. And, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but um, it's just, have you written a letter to, to resign your membership to, in the church? Why or why not? Well, it was interesting. I, um, as soon as I read, uh, I checked up on the site to see what kind of questions were going <clears> to <throat> be coming. And I saw that, and it was interesting. And I thought, oh, oh. And <laughs> there was that moment of, did I write? And I was like, no, I didn't. I guess I didn't. Um, but no, I, I haven't. And uh, it was interesting. The first thought when I read the question was, "Oh, that's some unfinished business I got to take care of." But, um, but I don't know. I uh, uh, it's interesting that that people have asked me that several times, and it's interesting that that's important. And I don't understand exactly the 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 clerical um, importance of that. That maybe would, a symbolic, <clears throat> truly cutting the tether. Or yeah, something. maybe so. It's a uh, gesture and, and that they uh, they feel compelled to make that maybe at least to this point you haven't. Yeah, no. Honestly, it's interesting that I kind of put it out of my mind because a year ago that was something that was really pounding away in my head, and I was thinking I need to do this. I should do this. It's time to do this. Um, and then I didn't, and um, I I uh, yeah. So so maybe uh, thanks for the reminder that maybe I need to take care of that. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's kind of interesting that it, uh, that it does carry such importance because, I mean, I've certainly left, I've left the church um, emotionally, I've left the church publicly, um, and, and yes, there's, there's some, you know, record in some clerics or clerk's office that, that has, uh, that counts me as a member of the church, so I guess I need to take care of some of the the accounting, some of the paperwork. You don't have the active, and you don't want to tip the balance in how many active members. <laughs> just, <laughs> just use it. Um, so yeah, so the question takes me a little bit off guard because it's uh, it, it seems very important to a lot of people, and and maybe that should be important to me, and it has been in the past. So, um, so well, terrible answer. I, uh, no, I think it's a, a a very interesting and a very good answer. Yeah. Appreciate you being but, so but honest. But if with I it. do do it, that's another thing. That's uh, uh, if I do feel that that's like something that's really important to do, and I can see why I think it, it could be important to do. Um, it's probably going to be a very long letter, or maybe I'll just include, you know, a copy of this this uh, <laughs> podcast <laughs> and say for my reasons. <laughs> You know, listen, listen to the to this. seven hours or however long we've gone. But yeah, I think if yeah, I do leave, even if it's, uh, you know, if I do leave in that kind of formal of a, of a way, then, uh, and I think I probably should because a lot of people are going to say, well, he's still, he's, he's still got his records on the membership, so he's still a member, and it's just kind of confusing for people, so I probably will. But when I do... Um, and I want to make sure that that letter again is something that's that acknowledges the the um, beauty of my time in Mormonism and how much I still value it and how much I'm grateful for it. And it won't be an angry letter. It won't be a you know the church has been awful and I'm leaving. It'll not be anything like that. It would just be a uh, it's time for me to go and thank you for um, 
thanks for the for journey. serving me on this journey. On this journey, and, yeah. And now I'm not going to drag you around with me yeah, as I keep yeah. moving forward. Yeah. yeah. So stop sending the home teachers. Around. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Last question or two, um, just because it came up through the the listeners who who asked questions ahead of time. Um, in any of this journey that you've been on. Um, have you found or looked at the ex-Mormon, post-Mormon message boards, kind of the groups and the, the things that have been in there? Have you spent any experience with them? And if so, have they served you in a positive way, a negative way, et cetera? Yeah, I, I spent a little time on, uh, on the postmormon.org site and found that to be, uh, for a time, that was very helpful. Like I say, there, there, was, there are different kind of cycles that at least that I've gone through. I don't want to universalize my own experience, but cycles that I went through, and and one of them that was really that was good to be there for a while. I would for a, for a few months there, I was pretty frequently checking in and kind of staying in some of the discussions and <clears throat> and found some good support there. But what I found was that that was a very temporary place for me, uh, in the sense that. I mean, if you, if you go back now, you're reading the same discussions and the same... Yeah, and it's because new people are coming right, to it. Right. That's the same thing I said at Sunstone all those years. It's the same topics over and over again, but yet it's a, it's a new audience that. Right, and it sort of definitely serves it a helpful purpose. Uh, I've always mm -hmm. tended to stay away from the... Uh, again, I went through a period where I, was, where I was kind of... where I was angry. There were things I was angry about. I was angry because I felt, to a certain extent, that I'd been duped by whether whoever it was or... Or whether it's just a, you know, a, a mass, you know, insanity that I'd bought into. But so there was a period there where I, um, I did feel angry, and I tried to my to the best of my ability to keep that private because again I didn't like. Um, uh, I still to this day cannot stand you know the anger in the in the anti-Mormon community and the post-Mormon community. When things get too angry, I just check out because it's like. This usually they're angry and they're not really speaking in a in a very informed way. Anyway, they're just venting, which is an important step, <laughs> right. maybe. But right. yeah, it's not. But I'm glad I never dwell. vented yeah, or I never sure. vented publicly anything. Um, so so yeah, I find them valuable. No, I don't hang around them anymore. But uh, and and I've avoided the the ex Mormon group. Frankly, I've been invited several times to go, but you know I, I'm. I have enough mutual friends who do go and have told me some of the crazy things that you know people wandering around in temple clothes and and that is so foreign to I, I want nothing to do with that you know even if you don't believe that it's sacred yeah well anymore, interestingly yeah, I, I had a yeah, uh, I was with just... someone recently who was talking to me a non-Mormon who was talking to me about the uh, about Mormonism and my leaving and and she asked me uh, about the temple and I was saying oh no there's some really beautiful things she goes I heard they touch your privates and and I said, okay. And I said, no, they don't. And it's a really beautiful ceremony. It's called initiatories, and they don't get anywhere near your privates. And and then she wanted to know the secret, you know, the secret handshakes and everything. And I was like, you know what? If you want those, you can go to the internet and figure that out. But uh, but uh, I'm at the place now where I, I uh, again, I have such affection for the community, and and I value my experience in it because I feel like it was very much an important part of my spiritual experience. But uh, I don't participate in the the anger. I always want to be considered a friend of Mormonism and of Mormons, um, and I don't think there's anything constructive to be gotten out of attacking it. And uh, uh, what other point was I trying to make before I got sidetracked on that story? But uh, but yeah, that, that's where I am. It's like I uh, I still have a lot of affection, but I don't, uh, and I do have things that I'm still a little angry about, but. I keep them to myself because, um, out of respect for, for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to loop back just for a second. I think I know the answers, but I want to ask them. They were asked in the list, and I think in your nineteen in your two thousand seven exit, you know, parting words to Mormon cinema, which was really about Mormon cinema and and helping to grow. You did mention that you you're hoping to not become a Thomas Marsh right. <laughs> figure. Uh, Today, so I'd love you to tell what you meant there, if you don't mind, and and have you felt like you've been treated the way Thomas Marsh was treated? No, actually, that came out. That was in the follow-up because I, I did oh, the thing in the, in the Daily Herald. Right, that was actually <clears throat> the one for Mormon Stories. You're right. And then, so I did the thing, and I and I, 
you know, I was asked to write for that editorial for the uh, Daily Herald, and they wanted me to just do a Mormon cinema, and I kind of came back and said, well, actually it's turning into more of this, are you guys still interested? And it's like, are, yeah, we're interested. In fact, we'll give you the whole page. <laughs> so that's what I gave them. And, uh, and I tried, so, I mean, that, that was such a heartfelt, um, I, I wrote that in the office right next to us here in my office, and it was like break. It was like a breaking. Up, it was like breaking up. And I was I was wiping away tears, and I was trying to do it, tr trying to communicate very clearly, but um, very sincerely and very gently. And I I wanted you know I wanted it to be a positive thing, and uh, sent it out there, and just immediately. I mean, the anger and the vitriol just came came at me in such force that it really did feel like I just opened up and was now I was getting kicked, you know? And that's when the follow-up came, when people were already on the internet saying, oh, he's probably a homosexual, he's probably having an affair, he's a drug addict, he's whatever, you know, just nonsense. Or In order people, to make it fit within this worldview yeah, that says yeah. it has to be something. Yeah, he said yeah. something about beer, it it's obviously be genuine. alcohol. It can't be genuine. It's just the, the stupidity and then the anger, and, uh, and that's when I came back and I'd been contemplating, and I'd watched that process over and over as people had left the church from the very beginning, and you know, their, their, the character assassination starts immediately. And that's when I just stepped up and said, okay, you know, this is probably going to happen to me, but I'm not going to go down without a fight, you know, and I'm going to at least point out what's happening while you're doing it. And uh, for our listeners who may not remember what, why Thomas Marsh was the example you chose. Tell Thomas him. Marsh was the example I chose because he was one of, you know, he's always brought up in Sunday school lessons as, you know, this is the apostle that threw away his exaltation everything. and everything because his wife was cheating another sister off of the strippings of the milk and he was so offended that she would be called on the carpet for it and so he left the church. And that's one of those stories that's such utter bullshit that when you look into it and realize that, no, he left during, you know, this was the Sidney Rigdon salt sermon days and far west when things went crazy, you know, and yeah. the lives of these leaders were being threatened by other leaders and they weren't happy with how things were going. And basically Thomas Marsh and Oliver Cowdery and a bunch of others just got out of town because their lives were in danger from the saints, from other leaders in the church. Who weren't turning the other cheek and right. who were, yeah, they were retaliating. It was complete insanity and they were yeah. actually in danger of being killed. Yeah. And so they got the hell out of town. And of course, that part of the story is never told. And yeah, I've so always he's been reduced very, to, as a full-blooded person with lots of reasons to this one soundbite, this exactly. morality tale. And, yeah. I, and I thought, this is going to happen to me. I do not want this to happen to me. And again, you know, instantly I have all these this complex story and the very painful story, And but people want to believe that it's because somebody wasn't buying tickets to my movies. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, so yeah, I just came out with that to say, okay, I'm, I'm aware this is what happens, you know, and you know, especially that idea of, you know, it's interesting when I left, a few people reached out to say, we love you, we want you back, what can, you know, is there anything we can help you with? Uh, but most people didn't, you know, it was that thing of most people, the wandering sheep, they don't reach out to bring it home, they get up on the tower, pull out the high-powered rifle and try to shoot your wandering brains out. Just because um, it, it makes their story less complicated if you're yeah, gone. Yeah, and there were things yeah. that I needed. You know, I, I I had fallen away at a point where I was as most probably as as worthy as somebody could be. There were all the, I mean interesting parts of my story that of course would be more interesting if, and it'd be easier to dismiss if I had just simply wanted to be a. a drug addict, gay drug addict. In fact, I ran into, shortly after this, I ran into a guy, uh, another guy, an artist who had left the church, just happened to run into him in an art museum in Springville. And he said, he goes, I totally know what you're going through. He's like, everybody, you know, you leave the church and they instantly think that two years from now you're going to be found dead and naked in a gay whorehouse with a needle in your arm, you know. <laughs> and it's like, that's exactly what, you know, people are reacting this way. Has it happened? I mean, it happened immediately in the aftermath or overall has, uh, um, are you still getting it? You know, I, I have to actually be pretty grateful because, I, and I don't know if it was because of that initial stepping out and saying, acknowledging this, but also the way that I expressed myself. And afterwards, I tried so very hard, um, even though I was aware of just the nastiest things being said about me on the internet, 
And there's always that reaction to get on and defend yourself. And I tried so hard. I failed in a couple instances, you know, when I was... It's hard to describe how hurtful that is, you know, to when you open up to that kind of a degree and you have just this malice being just poured out at you and uh, all the speculation and... and uh, but for the most part, I was able to, you know, hold my ground, just let people say what they needed to say and go on about their business. Um, and I, and whenever I would step in and try to defend myself, I'd always regret it. You know, it was like, that was foolish, that was stupid. Just, just let them say whatever they're going to say. So there's been a lot of generosity. But no, even, you know, even now it's been so long and even all this time that I've, I've made such pains to always very publicly be generous and, and, uh, you know, not angry, uh, and avoided every, you, there are so many opportunities when, you know, whenever something would happen with Mormonism in the world, newspaper people would write, would call me as like, will you comment on it? It's like, no, I don't want to comment on this, you know. I don't want to be your opposing Exactly, view. I'm yeah. not going to be your, your yeah. angry ex-Mormon, that's just not me. And so, uh, for the most part, uh, yeah, but it still, it still bugs me and it hurts me. It's like, you know, people from what I still consider in some ways to be my community, or at least the, my hometown where I grew up, yeah, that's a yeah, good way of putting it, way. who will get, you know, especially get on the internet or write to papers or whatever and just, and just say the most stupid, hateful things that uh, it gets to me, but I think that's the minority. And, um, and it's certainly not just Mormonism. It would be a phenomenon in any other close-knit yeah. religious community with a strong yeah. theology of why <laughs> yeah. people go wrong. Yeah. And, One and thing well, I have found yeah, interesting, so, though, yeah. it's, that I found very interesting is um, since I since I uh, went public, <laughs> well, basically since anybody's known, there's really, I don't think there's been a single time, except for when my stake president came over um, to visit, who was a very good man, by the way, and very very considerate, but nobody wants to know why I left except people who have left, mm. you know. Very interesting. Um, family members uh, that are still attending, friends that are still attending, none of them want to know my story, mm. you know. They don't even, in fact, even if we're, if we're at a dinner, some dinner party or something and the conversation starts to to lean towards things, and I start, you know, I, I, I know a lot about Mormon history and doctrine, so I'll start talking, and it's interesting how quickly I can clear out a table, <laughs> um, because uh, people really don't want to know, yeah. you know, and th that's been a little disappointing, and yet I understand that at the same time, it's kind of threatening, it's not, it's not like I was just some guy that wandered into the church, was there for a year and left. Um, yeah. um, they might have to wrestle with something in their own life if they... Right. Heard right. too much from you. If they yeah. open up a little too much and listen to, to the story, maybe it's a little too, it's a little too much. So. Well, in that 2007 um, thing, you also mentioned the possibility of becoming an Oliver Cowdery someday. Is that, is that, yeah, and, and what I mean is returning to the church, the um, embracing it in some way again, at least more formally and publicly. Has that uh, waned in the past three years since you at least left that tantalizing possibility out there? Well, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, I, well, I think that's pretty much an impossibility, honestly. But yeah, I, mean, I if think if I could... Even if I keep talking to you for another <laughs> 20 years, you're not coming my direction? I, I don't see it happening. But to be quite honest with you, what I would love to, if I could, if I could organize the universe in a way, in the way that I want it to be, I would love for, well, tomorrow, anytime, bring it on now, I would love to suddenly come to some understanding that would make everything make sense, um, including my, my very real experience of uh, separation, and, uh, and to come back knowing that it, uh, understanding I, that it was all real, that it's all true, and that I was uh, somehow wrong, or um, oh, oh, so that oh, that's I would I would love that's that an interesting, because again, like I say, I was yeah. happier then, hmm. but I don't think that's going to happen. But if I were just uh, if I were to say a, a spiritual fantasy, yeah, I think that would be it to be able to. Uh, I would love to come back 
but I can't come back unless I really believe it. And uh, I don't think that's going to happen. So. And Joseph Smith, just to be clear, still a powerful character, an interesting, powerful person, someone that you're still wrestling with, or have you pretty much figured out who he is and are you wanting to share? I think that? I figured out, pretty much figured out who he is. Um, and I still am fascinated by him, you know, and still uh, have a lot of, a lot of admiration for him. And it's more complex than to just say, and I know when I do make the film, I know there's going to be a lot of questions. Okay. Is he a prophet? Is he not a prophet? What do you believe right. in? I mean, we want, we like want the five-second answer. All the yeah, sign, sound good. bites just aren't going to And I don't want to ask you for a super easy answer, but mm -hmm. I was just kind of thinking, that, you know, the universe lines itself up and the, it, it's all true or not. I'm just wondering if maybe that conduit to it, or at least that thing that still is a umbilical as always is is the decision to keep wrestling with him and his life and the force. Yeah, I don't think of, the force much of, of his ideas anymore. so much. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not so much wrestling. Uh, I'm, I'm still very interested. Uh, actually, one point that I was trying to make earlier and I forgot about it because I got sidetracked. But when you know you're asking me where I am, I, it's interesting because I usually find myself being the defender of Mormonism because I find myself often in groups of non-Mormons or. Uh, and everybody has a you know something to on our team. talk about, <laughs> so, yeah. and so and and I find myself more often than not. I'm interesting because if I'm with a bunch of you know just true believing Mormons that want to talk about it but don't really know anything, then I find myself seeming to be the you know the uh, bearer of unpleasant news. Um, but I also find myself often in the situation of being with people who have axes to grind or they're you know, wanting to bitch about the church or Joseph Smith or whatever, and I find myself being the one uh, defending. Polarizing. It's opposite, like at least yeah. saying, okay, get your facts straight before you start. You know, <laughs> yeah. If you don't even understand the doctrine, then don't talk about it. And so I find myself yeah. uh, interestingly being the guy that uh, is drinking a beer and telling them that they're their anti-Mormonism is totally off base and ignorant, you know, so <laughs> if they're going to be anti-Mormon, they should yeah. at least be informed. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Um, you may not come back as a Mormon. You may not be Oliver Cowdery that says, I, I want to repent <laughs> and, and rejoin the community. Is there a chance to get you called back, or is there a chance that you still might called back and change your mind about Mormon cinema? I know you think it's dead and all that stuff, but there was a, there was a real... So many of these questions that came in is, oh, Richard, I still want you to tell the stories that we need to have told in Mormonism. Everything from, you know, I want you to tell the, the story of, uh, obviously, Joseph Smith. They, they want that told. Um, we want you to, you know, teach the world who Sonia Johnson is and tell that story. We want Levi Peterson's backslider and the cowboy Jesus to do it. And, and you're, our, you're our heroic filmmaker. You're our most talented <laughs> shining light. And we, we want you to make those films. So you've talked about Mormon cinema be dead. Is there any chance that you ever might come back and decide to really tell Mormon stories again or make Mormonism a a character in your films. Once well, more. yeah, Mormon cinema is dead, and I and I, As a I movement. think we've covered it's dead. And like okay. I say, it's not going to come back. There may be great Mormon filmmakers, um, but as far as Mormon cinema being some kind of cooperative movement, that's that's a nonsensical fantasy. Yeah. And so, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, as for me, making more films that deal with Mormonism, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Joseph Smith, obviously. But yeah, then, Joseph yeah. Smith. But there's more than that because there's so many. Powerful stories to tell. Would your true believer Western ever? I don't think make I could it? do that one again because that was so much tied up with, uh, you know, the restoration and, and it being a, a reality, uh, you know, in the universe. So I don't think I could do that again. Um, but uh, no, I mean, no. There, there are things uh, like I've got a list that I carry around with me. That's uh, these film either things that I'm actively working on, scripts that I'm working on, or concepts that are somewhat developed. That you're just, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Mormonism is a part of my, I mean, it's a part of me. It always will be. I mean, it was such a part of my spiritual evolution that, uh, that it's always going to, I think, influence my work. I'm, also, I'm always going to be responding to it in a certain way. Um, but even more directly than that, yeah, there are stories I want to tell. The Hans Mill Massacre, loved to tell it. 
the Mountain Meadows Massacre. That's mine, baby. I want that. You know, I, I want to make <laughs> oh, that. Oh, I thought you were the filmmaker that made September Dawn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was somebody who I hope was joking when, jo I'm sure when joking. you wrote that in. So. Um, and so things like that. Yeah, the Joseph Smith story. And, and there's more, you know. And uh, I would, yeah, I would love to tell these stories. And uh, okay, a lot good. of it's just, you know, financing and... and uh, but no, I don't see that. In fact, I, there was one guy, a friend was recently listening to, she, she was telling me that she'd mentioned that she knew me and this guy was ranting about um, the fact that, you know, I'm, I left the church and I still want to make, you know, he shouldn't make films about Mormons if he's not Mormon anymore. And I've always, and I find that really weird. You know, it's like I'm supposed to, you know, take this 30 years of my life and... and <laughs> Never let it inform anything else I ever Exactly. Yeah. It's like I, I've lost the right now to speak about Mormonism because uh, I don't go every Sunday now. So um, so that's where that is. And uh, yeah, so it's possible. It's possible. I'd, I'd, uh, in fact, I've, I've, got the, I've got a killer idea for a God's Army 3 of all things that uh, I would love to make. And it would obviously be di it was obviously very different from God's Army, but it's kind of the, the kind of the wrapping up of of everything. Um, it's kind of like Godfather Three, except it would be better because Godfather Three was no good. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so there's even that, you know. Which uh, and of course, when you'd see the story, any intelligent person would realize that there's no conflict between my own personal beliefs at this point and telling the story, um, because naturally I wouldn't be going in saying. And this means that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that Thomas Monson's a prophet, blah, blah, blah. You know, mm -hmm. They would just be stories about and, and have a lot to do with this. With universal themes that just happen to take place with very right. Mormon, very particular characters. Right. Yeah, right. Good storytelling. Yeah. Right. And like right. I said, yes, I, I and so you can uh, still consider yourself a spiritual, spiritual films is still your fit preferred genre if you could really oh yeah always absolutely. work on that you still want to wrestle with those kinds of things oh if i could spend my yeah. life just year after year making these you know it had to do with the cosmic question exploratory yeah. explorations and expeditions yeah i'd love it that's absolutely what i want to do and in fact that you know we talked earlier about that was kind of the purpose of movies like evil angel was to give me the financial freedom that i could do this and uh, but one of the things I'm doing now is making you know making a movie like Triptych, which is incredibly it's tiny tiny budget film, and mostly it's just being made by me putting my own money into it and any friends people who are willing to, you know, take a little risk. But uh, it's it's along that same line where it's like I'm I'm making a and and Triptych by I, we should mention this quickly before I leave since that's what I'm working on now, is. Uh, it's uh, a story, it's basically, I'm taking the, the concept of a, you know, triptychs, which were, especially during the Renaissance and beforehand. Uh, three panels. Three panel, often altar pieces that would, you know, some, the two side panels would fold in on the first one. So anyway, but it was, and they'd have to do with some scene, the crucifixion or one of the saints or whatever. And so what I, t what I wanted to do was make a cinematic, uh, kind of the equivalent of this, which is three stories that would be uh, interwoven and are separate, but they all have a, a similar um, theme and similar imagery. And all three of these stories in this film, Triptych, uh, have to do with, uh, you know, they're all, you know, spiritually based um, stories and explorations. In fact, one of the stories that I'm, one the, the central story, I still quite don't know how it ends yet because I'm still, um, one, of the, one of the things is largely shot another one I'm about to shoot, but then I'm, I'm, I'm letting this central story evolve like I did with Falling, where I'm not giving it a concrete ending yet because I want to see how it interplays. And I, and I frankly, I don't know where it goes. I don't know what the, the end of the road is because I'm asking a lot of questions that I don't have answers to. Now, if I understand right, you're not necessarily looking for investors in Triptych as much as patrons. You would rather just have people donate money through kickstarter.com that aren't looking to be paid back. Is that what you'd say? Or you're willing to go either direction? I mean, you probably couldn't sell them to them as this will be a commercial exactly. block, blockbuster. Yeah. yeah, and so that way, the Kickstarter approach, you know, it's a smaller amount of money and it's pretty upfront about, you know, you're, you're just don't, helping me to get this made. And well, uh, Do you want to share a number that would be your dream to receive in the next week? 
I'll dream to receive in the next week. <laughs> for, for that film. I mean, again, we've had numbers for to get Evil Angel distributed. Uh, <laughs> All those different oh, okay, things. So we'll throw out different numbers and maybe we'll find somebody who, uh, who says well, I'm I'd be impressed with this guy. To, if, if I found someone who was willing to donate or invest $10,000 in, in Triptych, that would be fantastic. Uh, that's, we're talking about a very low budget movie here. So, and that would help me basically get the movie finished. And then your goal would be a theatrical release? or oh, just definitely a, a theatrical okay, release. Okay, so yeah. it would be at least high enough quality to, to play in a Cineplex? Oh, and, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to okay. so not not... do crap. And it's going to, I mean, most likely it'll play, you know, in Salt Lake City, maybe Los Angeles or New York or something like that. But mostly it'll probably play, play there and then immediately go to foreign markets and DVD. So very small, so it doesn't, it's, uh, it's not risking a lot of money. So a few foreign sales and you've already got, you know, your money back. Uh, but I think the important thing for me is this is this is the way that I've, I'm, you know, dealing with the current way my my career and, and world economics is going is, you know, scale things down, uh, go really into deep subjects and uh, things that there uh, things that aren't being addressed or treated in any kind of films is I think is a could be potentially successful because there'll be an audience of people like the people that are listening to like this or that are interested in spiritual things um, that uh, I think would really welcome something you know like a, a deep dark exploration of spirituality and that's deep, what dark well just a deep uh, now this one's turning out to be deep and dark okay and, uh, at least one of the stories is turning out to be deep and dark and uh, uh, one of the stories, it's, it's called The Boy Who Found Dead Things, and it's, uh, it's, I've really just fallen in love with this little story. It's like a little short story of a movie, and I've just fallen in love with it. Beautiful little, little thing, a beautiful little story. So that, but that's juxtaposed with something that's a little bit darker and more grown up in you know, spiritual terms. But that's something that's very important to me. It's like, I, I mean, how often do you get to have a kind of an actual grown up adult discussion or exploration of spirituality in cinema it just hardly ever happens so I continue to be committed to that and uh, I'm sure at some point Mormonism will find its way back into into that uh, if these investments don't come or if these uh, these uh grants or gifts or however you'd want to put it don't come. Main Street Movie Company has opened its doors to filming commercials Right. Uh, yeah. What what are, what's what's on the menu of offerings that if somebody says, well, my company is looking to do this or that or the other thing, right? What types of things are you set up to do? Well, that's one of the things we we've set up to do, and something we're pursuing more now is just doing commercials. Uh, we have a lot of fun with the the ones we've done so far. We've had a lot of fun with and. Uh, but yeah, again, it's like commercials aren't my calling in life, but if commercials you know, bring me a little revenue that I can put it into movies like Triptych, and again, that's what it's all about for me, is like everything is how do I keep making these movies? So yeah, anybody that's got a company that needs a commercial, um, that's, that's another way to... Any other you know. projects? I mean, would you promotional videos, telling the company's story? Would you be willing to film those types of things too, or would you want to just stick with the really short 30 and 60? Oh, we can do anything. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if it's like an industrial film, I may not personally be directing the right. the piece, but uh, yeah, it can go through the company. You could. Okay. Right. Yeah. You you either have the people in house, or you certainly have good relationships with people that could handle right. pretty much whatever you the project would be. Right. right. Great. Well, that's great to know. Now, Richard, I tell you, for those of you who don't know, we started around six, and we're looking at two in the morning right now. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your stamina. Thank you for your openness, the generosity with which you've told your Mormon story and your universal story and uh, that you've given us a peek behind the curtain to just so many wonderful things. And uh, I uh, love you more than I, than I did when I walked in this room, which was already a lot. I just uh, value you as a, a great friend and, and somebody who I've... Uh, been been blessed to to get to know very much so seriously how, uh, what a, an opportunity to spend this much time talking about something that's this you know important and complex uh, it's uh, so thanks for the invitation to do it in this forum because uh, uh, and, and you've given me plenty of time and you, and plenty of consideration so if anything hasn't been communicated well then that's just my own you know lack of 
of uh, eloquence, but uh, but yeah, we, I think we, we covered wanna, a lot. I'm happy with it. We want to so. sell videos. We want to sell <laughs> sell getting your commercial made by you. We want to uh, sell some of these projects, some of the the financial needs that you have as far as uh, getting distribution for Evil Angel and opening right. the door to the other things. And so yeah. uh, that certainly wasn't our main purpose or the reason for doing this. But I'm I'm hoping that those of in this audience who who love you, who respect your talent who still are pleading for you to <laughs> you know, tell our stories or whatever it is. Uh, I know that it's going to touch some people out there and they're going to buy the Dutcher collection or they're going to, who knows what it is, uh, maybe a Forbes 100 <laughs> person will, will come forth and say, Joseph Smith, 15 million, no problem. Well, that'd be nice. Yeah, that so. would be nice. Great. Well, thank you again very much. Uh, thank you to our listening audience, uh, to our viewing audience who are seeing this on video. Um, we have had a good time, and we've, uh, I think we've about exhausted ourselves. Great. Though. So Great. thank you again. Great. Good night. Good night. Still all my songs shall be near